we are uh, in a series where we're, we're exploring this claim of Jesus that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And, and this claim, this proclamation, this, um, these words that Jesus speaks, it is about freedom. I, one of the things that I want to make sure is, is that when you hear this, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that the, the way, it, it's picturing a road, uh, a pathway, but it, it was a picture about here's the way to live. This is, you walk along this and, and your walk is your life. And what Jesus is claiming here is, is that I am the way to live. I, I'm going to lead you into life that is really life. Uh, he's the way to live because he's truth. And truth is about aligning ourselves to reality. Um, there is a God and he has made the universe that we live in. And today we are plumbing the depths of looking at the reality that he has plans for us. That not only did he make us and he made us in a certain way, but he knew us by name and he has a purpose for us. The way, the truth, the life, aligning yourself to reality, learning to live life, how Jesus leads us, this is real life. And um, a number of weeks ago we talked about the reality that following Jesus, the way that we're supposed to experience this is it's much more about get to than have to. It's much more about this passion and desire of something that I'm given to do. And today we're going to talk about the fact that we're on mission, that Jesus has a purpose for us, and, and we define that by saying that as a church and as, as, as each person who participates as a member of the church, we're called to share in the mission of Jesus. And... Um, and I thought as a way of beginning that I would actually share a number of different scripture passages, uh, all by Jesus. Every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then even the book of Acts, we see Jesus and he knows that he is preparing a people who are going to be sharing in his mission and work. I want to start with John chapter 20 and... Um, this is a scene where it's after the resurrection, and the, the disciples themselves are still afraid. They're, they're, they're concerned because Jesus was killed, and even though they've seen Jesus, this is all new, and they're kind of struggling to catch up to reality. And in John chapter 20, beginning in verse 19, we hear this. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, and John here is giving us a picture of, of this context, where first day of the week is Sunday. But right now, the irony is, is that Sunday, which becomes the Lord's Day, which is the day that we now gather and we remember that Jesus was raised from the dead, at this point, they're still huddled in the dark, afraid, fearing that they're going to be persecuted. Jesus wants us to set, set us free from our fears. So Jesus came and stood among them and he said, peace be with you. And the idea of peace, the Jewish idea is shalom. May the fullness of life be with you. May a flourishing whole life. May life the way it's intended to work because now you are at peace with God and may you be at peace with one another. May love and life, may that be yours. That's what Jesus was saying. May peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed, his nail marks and where he'd been pierced. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now, our Greek Bibles, or our Bibles, or uh, the New Testament come to us through Greek, and, and they get translated. In, in the ancient world, as it came into Western civilization, into the Roman part of the empire, they spoke Latin. And the word for sent in Latin is missio, from which we get the word mission. As the Father has missioned me, so I am missioning you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. 
Jesus is inviting us to share in his mission. He was sent, we're sent. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And John here is giving us this picture of the commissioning that that we have. Ultimately, this will take place with the full sense of the power of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. But here, John is giving us the picture that we end up finding in every gospel that Jesus knew that he was forming a people who he would send on his mission and that he is going to be with them and enable them through the power of his Holy Spirit. The most well-known passage for this commissioning where we are on mission with Jesus is found in Matthew 28. The 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. This is again post-resurrection. For 40 days, Jesus was with his disciples, appearing among them, and then, and then had them wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And during this time, after the crucifixion, but before he ascended, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. <clears throat> in John's gospel, we had the language of reconciliation. The, those that you forgive, they will be forgiven, and those who, who, who you don't forgive. And how are people forgiven? They're forgiven through responding to Jesus. If you confess with your heart, Jesus is the Lord, believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Forgiveness comes through accepting Jesus. And so he charged the apostles, go out and share that good news. And anybody who accepts, you confirm that their sins are forgiven. But if you don't accept, then your sins aren't forgiven and you're still in condemnation. Here we see the, the very same thing again, where he's going to send us out, and you're going to go and you're going to make disciples, and you're going to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're going to bring them into this life. And the same idea was in John, but now it's very much present here, and I'm going to be with you, always. This isn't about just what you're doing. This is about you sharing your life with me. You're getting involved in my mission work. Now, it's not just something that Jesus did after his resurrection. He knew leading up to the cross that he was forming a group of people and that they were going to continue his work of sharing the mission. We hear the very same idea found in Mark. In Mark's gospel, there's actually a couple of different places. One thing I want to draw your attention to is that in Mark's gospel, at the very end of it, you're going to find a number of verses, and they're going to be, if in your modern translations, they're going to be all in italics. And there's going to be a little note that says the earliest manuscripts don't have these verses in them. And as Christians, we believe that those verses at the end of the Gospel of Mark were sometime later added in, and they aren't part of the original. And if you were to turn to those verses, you would find very clearly Jesus saying, just like we have in Matthew, go and make disciples, baptizing them, and you have that whole thing. You get a little bit of an added thing where you'll pick up snakes, and if they bite you, you'll still live. And that's where it's kind of like, yeah, that sounds like something that got added later. Um, but, but in Mark's gospel, you get the very clear sense that we are sent on mission, but it comes before the resurrection. Jesus was preparing his disciples the week leading up to his death. They wanted to know, how is this all going to work out? When is the world going to get set right? When will this fallen, broken age of death and sin finally be done away with? And in the course of that conversation in Mark chapter, 9, chapter 13, verses 9 through 10, Jesus said this, You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. Before the end comes, the gospel must first be preached to all nations. And later on, he'll tell them to go up on the mountain in Galilee, and then he'll be there. And we heard about that same scene in um, Matthew, where Jesus met them and charged them and said, here's what you're going to do. In Luke 24... 
Jesus told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And, and, and so he's, he's getting them ready. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you. I'm going to give you my spirit. All four gospels, every testimony of the life of Jesus, when we hear Jesus speak, he was preparing a people who was going to share in his mission. Acts, still the life of Jesus, the story of Jesus. And in the beginning of the book of Acts, Luke goes back, Luke chapter 1, or Acts chapter 1, verse 6. They gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And for them at that point, they're thinking, are you going to finally fulfill the promises and the old evil age is going to fall away? And this is what Jesus said. He said, it's not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set of his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. The clear message of Scripture Every testimony of the life of Jesus, the book of Acts. And then if you want, you can go through all the letters. Jesus f- formed a people, and he's given us the gift, the opportunity to participate with him in mission. Just as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Now, I, even as I say that, I, I want to I say something about the good news that Jesus has given us. There is nothing that you can do that can make God love you more. And there's nothing that you can do that will make him love you less. This this mission, it isn't what saves us. This is about how God has made us. You see, he made us for love. And love is primarily action. Feelings are included, but it's not primarily feeling. It's primarily action. And the reality is, is that when you love and you see somebody that you love struggling, going through hard work, labor, you want to do something, anything. That's that's just how it works. My wife and I have three wonderful kids. And... um, and I, and I want to tell a story about how our first daughter was born, and, and I want it really to be an analogy for you about this whole thing of just how love works. And, and it's this, this inner, passionate, get-to thing. And um, one of the things that I'm really thankful for as a pastor is that I, I, look, I really receive this as a gift. All three of my kids were born on a Monday. <laughs> and... Um, and that's my, that's my, that's my Sabbath day. That, so Sunday I work and then Monday and then that's the day I rest. And, 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 and they all were born on Monday. And one of the things, you know, you worry about is, yeah, and, I, and I do know what decision I would have made. I would have been with my wife and I would have called the church and be sick or whatever. But I never had to do that. It, it just always worked out. But the first child, when Hannah was born... That was, the, in, it was, you know, I mean, it was the new thing. We'd never gone through this before. And, and we didn't have kids yet. And, and so Monday meant that was my day to sleep in. It was glorious. And so I, I, I wake up, and then I, and I come out, and my wife is sitting at the breakfast table, and her feet are up, and she's sitting in a chair, and she says, well, looks like the baby's on the way. What? Okay, it's time to go. And and you know and and I, and I felt this flood of I'm sure it was adrenaline just rushing through. You know, so, okay, it's, what? And no, 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 no. We we're not going to go yet. What do you mean? You, you, yeah, yeah. No, the, no, it's too far out. I I want to wait till I'm seven centimeters. What? Huh? Huh? Okay, that's the right answer. You just go along. Okay, okay. And but I wanted to do something. And, and see, this is the part where I get, it was mostly her work, right? I mean, it's her labor. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of superfluous, but I'm going to be there. Anything I can do, let me do something. Salvation is primarily Jesus' work. But we get to do something, right? I mean, you did all of this for me. I love you. Let me do something back. And so, so 
I start cleaning. Because that's good, right? That's something. And I, I, I cleaned the kitchen, and I vacuumed the house, and, and then I learned an important lesson. Because my wife was, you know, this is her first time, and she's kind of figuring out how this all works. And when, when the contractions, she wanted to walk, and it helped. But she was woken up in the night, and she let me sleep. I mean, it was, I can't, she let me sleep in. I, I, and so she would go and lay down and take a nap because, it, but then the contractions would come and then she'd start walking. And I'm vacuuming and I get in her way. Not a good idea. I, I made her stop walking. So I stop and then I start cleaning outside. And, and I go into a rhythm. I, I wash the car. I come in and I check on her. I vacuum the car. I go in and check on her. I mow the grass. I go in and check on her. I trim all of the grass. I go in and check. Or is it time? Is it ready? Anything. I just want to do something. And you see, the gift of participating in the mission is that God understands the way that he's made our hearts. Love is primarily an action. When you love and you see the one that you love and they have a tough work, they're struggling, there's something. You want to do something. And you see this mission being sent the way that God has made us. He knows how he made us. And it's to be all grace. Hear these words. Some of the most beautiful words we have, one of the pictures of describing our salvation, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace that you have been saved. It's all gift. The, the grace is through faith. And even this faith is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. You see, you're not saved by any of your works. Salvation isn't about what you need to do. Part of that is so that no one can boast and think that, they're saved because they're smart enough or good enough or strong enough because we're not. But then it goes on, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. There is a place for works. It's just not the saving place. It's the responding place. And listen to this, to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. God knows your name. He knows every hair on your head. He knows how many hairs you have on your head. He has a mission for you. Specifically for you. Where you get to join. Where you get to do something because of the love that you have. Because of what he has done for you. This is about life. It's really life. So how do we find this mission? Well, I want to offer another analogy and as a way of, of introduction. I grew up as part of the generation where when I was a child, Saturday morning was a special time. Because from about 6 o'clock in the morning until about 11 o'clock, there were cartoons on all three stations. <laughs> um, and it was glorious because you could move from station to station and you're going to get a cartoon and it was wonderful. And, and when I was young, every once in a while, there would be like college football and, it'd be insta and I, that would be kind of frustrating because I'd miss some of my cartoons. But there was a cartoon that probably most all of you are familiar with. And it, it was about a certain sailor and his girl, Olive Oil. And... Uh, Popeye the Sailor Man was uh, this pretty odd-looking but low-key sort of, of guy. Most of the time, he had a really long fuse. You know, he was even-keeled, and he got along, and he liked to be happy. But when he saw something that was injustice, where evil was happening, and, and, and while he tried to put up with things himself, at some point, that long fuse would give up, and then he would say something, and most people who watch Popeye, and mo most people who watch Popeye, they know this statement, that's all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. <laughs> and, and, and then, 
the mild-mannered person would rip off the lid of, of the can of spinach and he would swallow the whole can of spinach and then typically his forearms would like grow to about four times as large and he would be filled with like this supernatural superpower where he would then go do battle with evil so that good might triumph. Now, when he finally overcame the evil, he would go back into his, his regular state and then he'd sing a song and I won't sing for you, but he would say, I'm strong to the finish because I eat my spinach. I'm Popeye the sailor man. And um, one of the interesting things about that cartoon is, is that when it came out in the 1930s, not, we probably aren't surprised by this, but it, it impacted the generation of kids. There was a 33% rise of children eating spinach um, because of Popeye the sailor man. Now, while it was nice that he impacted the fact that kids ate spinach, I want to put forward that there is a deeper lesson that we can learn from Popeye. And that is, is that God has given you a heart of love that is geared to be good, that wants good things to happen. And there's times in life where you experience, I've I've, I can't stand anymore. I've had all that I can stand and I can't stand anymore. And you know that there's something that needs to be done. It's kind of a, this, this statement, and I, and I think there's truth in, about this. There is a place where the world is in great need and there is a place where your heart will break. And more often than not, that is the place where God is going to send you. That's part of his mission plan of bringing his righteousness, goodness, justice, the good news of Jesus who wants to bring peace and shalom into this world. Martin Luther King Jr. is an example of somebody who got to a place, I've had all that I can stand and I can't stand no more. By, by calling, he was a pastor. But as a pastor, God was at work in his life in such a way that he is one of the greatest social reformers that we have ever seen in the world. The racial oppression that he saw all around him in the United States in the 50s and 60s, it ripped him up on the inside. He couldn't stand the signs that said white onlys that were at water fountains and bathrooms and doors to restaurants. He couldn't stand the fact that blacks, by law, were pushed to the back of the bus or forced to give up seats altogether so that white patrons could sit down. He couldn't stand the reality that his people were always found at the end of the receiving lines for education, employment, and housing opportunities. He wanted the lynchings to stop. He wanted segregation banished. He wanted justice to be served so that his kids could grow up in a different world than the one that he was living in. And there came a day when he couldn't stand it anymore and he no longer became just somebody sitting on the sidelines but he actually became a leader to get into this fight and to do something about it. And I want to put forward, it was a Popeye moment. I've had all that I can stand, and I'm listening to my heart, and I can't stand no more. King lived just to be 39 years old. But from the time that he started standing up to this fight, he gave his life and passion with all that he had. It was characterized by nonviolence, by a desire for freedom and justice. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize at the University of Oslo in 1964. And at the end of his acceptance speech, he said this, I refuse to accept the idea that the isness of man's present nature 
makes him immorally incapable of reaching up for the eternal oughtness that forever confronts him. This may be the way things are right now, but I don't think that we have to settle for that. I believe that there is inside of us a push, a power, a desire, an ought of what should be, that it comes from God, and that if we would listen to that, this world could change. This is what it looks like. One example of living in this place of holy discontent. I've had all that I can stand and I can't stand no more and something needs to be done. Martin Luther King's heart broke here. The reality is, is that God has formed each of us special and unique. Each of us has a heart. Again, Yours may not be Martin Luther King's issue, but the reality is, is where your heart breaks and where the world needs, there is a place and God has a mission. And I'm sure because of the passion, the desire of you getting up and wanting to be part of something and doing something, God is at work in that. Especially if Jesus is first in your life, following him, committing, wanting to make a difference in his name. I... I, I know a person who, she, she experienced life change as a child in Sunday school. Her parents weren't religious, but they had her go to Sunday school. She went to Sunday school and she met Jesus. And, and out of that experience, her desire was for children to be able to meet Jesus in Sunday school. And that's where her heart broke. And, and and even when she was getting to the place where she was concerned that she was just too old, she continued to do whatever she could to try to help make Sunday school better for kids in her church. The world will look at the issue and they'll think some things are greater than others based upon the results. What Jesus looks at is, is are you true to who I've made you to be? There is a place in this world for you to make a difference. God, in advance, has prepared good works for you to do. I, uh, before I became a Christian, my, my life was going to be about making money. And then, and then I became a Christian, and I went, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Lord, I want to live my life for you. But I wasn't quite sure what it would look like. To be perfectly honest, what I, what I originally hoped for was is that I could have just kind of a quiet life where I could read books and write papers and teach in, in, in university. And then one day, I was sitting in a class and I was listening about what a pastor is supposed to do and I was having a vision of the church that was being shaped where the church is not a country club where we all make ourselves feel better and pat ourselves on the back, but the church is the mission of God at work in this world, that the local church is the hope of the world to bring real lasting change of the good news. I started to hear this and I started to hear it and, I, and I'm like, okay, it'd be really nice just to live a quiet little life and not have to deal with people all the time. <laughs> but I don't... I don't want just to live a quiet life. I want to be part of a movement of people that end up impacting this world. So, I do what I do because my heart breaks here because I want to see a church that is on mission together. And then there's this. There's a lot of things in life where it just feels like busy work where I just, you know, I dig a hole and then I fill it back in. And there's not a lot of meaning in that. Jesus is calling us to be part of a mission that makes an eternal impact. William James said, the best use of life is to spend it on something that outlasts us, to make a difference. 
we are invited graciously, wonderfully to find a passion in our hearts where our heart breaks for this world and that we can then make a difference in Jesus' name. And it isn't going to just be for today or tomorrow, but it has the opportunity of making an eternal difference. I think God created us as beings who, who care about meaning and purpose. Jesus comes and he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Come and follow me and I have a purpose for your life. You are special. You're going to make a difference in this world. I'm always going to be with you. You can't do it by yourself. It's not your major work. It's mine, but you have a place. The Apostle Paul, his life was changed. And he said this, he said, My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Will you pray with me? Loving Heavenly Father, give thanks and praise. You have a purpose for us. You have good works for us. You have loved us and you have graced us. And you have made us with hearts that want to do something, anything, when we experience love and see our beloved. May our hearts be changed. May we hear that this is about grace. We can stumble and fall. We, we have, may have been sitting on the sidelines for years. But may we hear your call today. In Jesus' name, amen.